I, I did it a little bit in conjunction with a uh, naval flight surgeon by the name of Frank Dully. And he did a lot of the research in it, and I've done my own research in it. And what we'd like to do is talk to you all about who you are as an individual, kind of dealing with a little bit about the kind of personality that you are to be in this business. As I say this thing and as I talk about it, please do not believe that I'm putting you down or being totally negative. The briefing comes across somewhat negative if you look at it in that context. Most of you guys are pretty dang up good at what you do, okay? And I'm not putting you down, I'm getting you to think a little bit about who you are, trying to deal with some of the frustrations of this business. If I say anything that appears to be crude, I do not say it for the sake of crudeness. In other words, I'm not up here saying it to be crude so that y'all laugh at it. What I'm doing is repeating back to you what you will say to me when I ask you something in a research mode. The way you normally talk to me is what I'm going to say back to you uh, here today. With that as an overview, what I'd like to do is go ahead and tell you the four characteristics that you need to be good in this business. Number one, you've got to be in control. Number two, the male-female interface is characterized by distance, and it's an emotional distance. Number three, you're a mission-oriented compartmentalizer. And number four, you're extremely predictable. Those four characteristics must be inside your makeup in order you for, be, for you to be in this business for all practical purposes. So let me talk about them individually, okay? Now, I want you to understand one thing. This is a stereotype briefing. And I'm saying that all of you fit within inside this system, and you know that's not true, okay? Some of you fit in a little bit, some of you fit in a lot, some of you might not fit in hardly at all. But all of you can gain a little bit from this, and this is why we're going through it. In control, measured input gives measured response. I move stick to right, airplane turns right. I kick on yoke and the airplane turns to left. I turn on little radar scope and little thing goes whipping around the radar thing, whatever that is. I crank on handle, door opens. Good things, good response to every stimulus that I put in. Well, if it's so good here, it's very good at home too because I can use it there. And since it's good here, I'm going to use it at home. I'm going to try to be in control of that too. And I try to be in control of my family and my kids and my wife. I try to be in control of just about every surrounding that I'm in. If I cannot be, then I will exit stage left. I will try to get out. Let's say tonight you go home. You say to the wife, well, gee, what are we going to do tonight? She says, honey, there's a wonderful thing downtown. Let's go down to this convention down there. And you say, well, I don't really want to. And she talks you into it. And you go. And you get into the convention, and they are talking about gynecology. And you're going, huh? This is what I'm talking about over here. About 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night, you're looking at your watch. You're already yawning. <sighs> God, honey, I got to get up early tomorrow. Let's go ahead and take off from here. You'll find some kind of excuse to get out of there because nobody there is talking about what you like to talk about, which is, okay, some sort of aspect of flying or something in this job that you're doing. Usually, you're the oldest son. If you're not the oldest son, you were probably the controlling son when you were growing up. And you lived under the auspices of the old man, and the old man for you was different than for most people. He was kind of a weird person because what he did is he started treating you differently as you became more and more a man, which is somewhere around your 13th birthday. He started stopped change, or talking to you about, well, that he loved you, that he cared about you. He started giving you symbols of his affection. Let's say this gentleman here was uh, 16 years of age. He went out and he cut the lawn. He came back in, expected the old man to pat him on the back and tell him that he loved him. That's why he did it. What did the old man say to him? Nice job today, son. Why don't you take the car out tonight and get a little bit? <laughs> See, that's the way he told you that he cared about you. He gave you those symbols. And so you and I spend a lot of time in this business looking for symbols of affection because it tells us how we're in control of things. And what better way than the kind of rank that we wear on our shoulders? It says we've been in control for a certain period of time. In my case, been out of control for a little bit, okay? Uh, how about the kind of wings that we wear? I'm not saying navigators and pilots. I'm saying, you know, slick wing or stars or Reese on top of that. If you've got a slick wing, you've only been in control for about seven years. No more of that. And if you got that star, you've been in control a little longer. And of course, if you end up with the commode pot on top of that, man, you've been in control a long time, okay? And so we look at that as symbols of affection and symbols of control. How about the medals that you guys wear? How many of y'all wear your medals on a day-to-day -day basis? You wear them once in a while? Ribbons. Yeah, the ribbons, yeah. Very few of us do. Most of us, if we wear the blues, we will not wear it, even though we're authorized to wear them. You know why you don't wear them normally? 
Do you understand why you don't wear them? Don't have that many. You're kind of embarrassed about them. Or you wear as many as the next guy that has the same amount of years in the service as you do. Everybody's got the same amount depending on how long they've been in. If you've been in for one year or two years, you've got maybe two ribbons. And if you've been in five years, you've got maybe a row, row and a half. If you've been in 10 years, you're up to two rows. 15 years, three rows. 20 years like me, five rows, man. We got them all. Boom. What do we get them for? Beats the hell out of me. I just got them. Everybody got them. And so you don't need to show that in the squadron with anybody else. Everybody else knows that they're worthless as two tits on a boar hog. We all get them at a certain pay phase. I got some DFCs in Vietnam for flying Harry missions. Heavens no. You know what they told me? Well, you're up to the point in time where you need a DFC. Uh, next time you go out and fly, write yourself up for one. Okay? Didn't have anything to do with the missions I flew. Some of the hairy ones I flew, I didn't get anything off of, okay? And so you and I don't wear those because we know that they're basically worthless. But I'll guarantee you one thing, folks. If you ever have to go downtown and wear your Class A uniforms, you will put those suckers on with pride. Those clowns down there don't know about that. Hey, man, look at me. I'm a hero. I've been in control all this time. Look at that. Somebody says, what's that one on the top? She says, beats the crap out of me, but ain't it pretty? <laughs> so I paid 18 cents for that one at the BX. Those are symbols of affection, and those people downtown don't understand that they don't have a great value to us unless we have a whole lot of them. They just think that we're wonderful people, so we will wear those to show others who we are. Okay? Um, the aviator is one of the true professions in that you lose your life if you make mistakes, and so you take that as part of the mystique of this business. You know that you're in a fairly risky business, and that's why you're here. Number two, you're in the what we call safety wired in a pissed off position. Most of you guys are fine, thank you all the time. How you doing? They fine, thank you. Everything's great. No problem whatsoever. Someone yanks your chain too hard. One time, boom, back into the ceiling you go. We get you back down. How you doing? Fine, thank you. No problem. If you believe that's the way the squadrons are and the people in the squadrons are, you better take a look at yourself. Is that the way you are 24 hours a day? I don't think so. But that's what we project. We project that we've got ourselves in control at all times, even though that's not true in our own lives. <clears throat> Most of you like controllers. The people around you as your friends will be controlling sorts of people. Now why would you have as friends around you controllers? Now I, let me tell you first of all how many friends you'll have. You might have 15, 20 people that you call friends, but you only have one, two, and a max of three that you will call true dear friends. And most of you will have one. Some of you will have two. Very few of you will have three. The reason being it takes a lot of energy to put into that other person and let him know a little bit about what's inside your gut. And we don't like those close relationships, so we have one or two max, okay, in almost all cases. Well, why would we want controllers around us at that point in time? Anybody figure out why? Because that clown's exactly like us. He's the same sort of person we are. And we know that any situation we get into together, he's going to react the same way we do. He's a spitting image of us. And so we accept him as our friend that way. We like controllers so much, we marry them. Most of you all are married to first daughters and or controlling daughters in their family when they were growing up. And whenever you have controllers together 24 hours a day, what else do you have? Friction, conflict, bullshit. You have World War III about once every week. Okay, let's talk turkey, folks. Because the reason being is the two of you are trying to bat heads with each other to see who's in control. And if you're married to control, that's exactly what happens. And we say this, that if you have a uh, married to a spouse that is a controller, you must have a written or unwritten rule between the two of you. That when one speaks in anger, the other one keeps their daggum mouth shut or you'll be married singles within five years. You'll talk about weather, you'll talk about TV, you'll talk about food, but you sure as heck are not going to talk about what's inside your gut because you don't know how to talk to each other. The number one cause of divorce in this business is 91% of all divorces in this business have as a number one cause, lack of communications. By the way, if you're 40 years of age, you have a, about a 47% chance of being divorced in this business. Very high divorce rate, okay? Just want to make sure you understand that. Aviators are poor in feelings. Feelings are for queers and sissies. Feelings are for those other people that are light. We don't show feelings. What we have is shams and facades to cover our feelings. We are the fine thank you generation. I'm fine, thank you, no problem whatsoever, okay? 
And we use those shams and facades to show everybody else that we're in control. We're the last people in the world to know when we're getting a divorce. And some of you all seen it in your own squadrons. Yeah, I don't know why old Joe got a divorce. I thought he was fine, thank you. He thought he was too. He was not even aware of it. And one of the things that I'll explain to you later on what happens is you don't become aware of problems at home because you get your feelings from a different place. Okay? And I'll explain that phenomenon to you a little later on. Which brings me to my second point, that the male-female interface is characterized by distance, that emotional distance, which rolls back into feelings. Emotions are very risky to show. Uh, you can be misinterpreted when you show your feelings. You can get crapped on for showing your feelings, and we take them as defects. Think about it. You walk into the squadron commander in the morning, you say, I don't want to go fly an airplane. I don't feel good. <laughs> What's going to happen to you, folks? How long do you think you're going to get by with it? That is not acceptable in this business. And so what you do is you submerge them. You get rid of them. You get to the point where you don't even know what your feelings are. It's a very interesting phenomenon. What we did is we took a lot of you all individually and we set you down in a room and we on purpose tried to piss you off. You're the easiest group in the world to piss off. As aviators, you're more easy to piss off than any other group of professionals there are. Because if we know something, just a little bit about you, we can grab a hold of something and get you all snatched up, okay? And we did it on purpose. And we sat these people down and got them angry and we stopped the interview and we say, what are you feeling right now? And the young guy would sit there and say, I'm pissed off. I'm really angry. And we say, good. You're in touch with it. We take the older guy and set him down. And we get him pissed off and we say, what are you feeling right now? And guess what he said? I'm fine, thank you. No problems at all. And you can tell he had his clenched teeth, etc. Or he would give the intellectual pursuit of a feeling. I feel like you guys shouldn't do this. I feel like this is a bunch of crap. I feel like this is unfair. And we said, no, not what are you thinking. What are you feeling in your gut? And around 67% of the cases, we had to take out a list of feeling words and hand it to the guy and say, pick one of these out. Because he truly didn't get in touch with his feelings. Didn't even know what they were. And of course, when you don't show your feelings, what does your spouse say about you? You unfeeling SOBs. You people have no idea how we feel. You're cold. You have no idea how the children feel. You people don't feel. And when you run through life, and as you get older in life, things change in your perspective. And what was weird for you or different for you at 25 changes when you get to 35 and 45. And all of a sudden you run through what they call life crises. 35 to 45, you're looking at maybe sitting down from flying, maybe getting out of the service, maybe your children leaving the house, maybe your wife leaving you. I don't know what it is, but there'll be life crises that come along to you. And you'll finally have some feelings about those. Who will you tell your feelings to? Who will you tell your feelings to? Let me go through a list. Wing commander. <laughs> Squadron commander. Flight surgeon. Psychiatrist. It's only for sickos and weirdies, right? How about a rabbi and minister and a priest? Heavens no. How about your squadron mates? They already know. You've already acted it out in front of them. Guess who you'll tell your feelings to? Your spouse. Guess what your spouse will say to you after you've been controlling her for the last 15 or 20 years? Right there, Jack. Sit on it and rotate. That's your problem, not mine. Now, that's going to create more problems in your life, okay? But just be aware that it's going to happen that way. If an individual loses control and shows his feelings, sometimes he will exit stage left, as I said before. Let me kind of get that in a brief scenario. Let's say last night my wife and I were talking and having problems about one of our children, the oldest one, let's say. And we sat there. By the way, my wife and I argue about children. We argue about sex. We argue about communications. And we argue about uh, money. Is that, is that standard for most of you? Yeah, I figured it would be. We don't argue that much about communications. We can't talk to each other, so we argue about the other things. All right? We were arguing about the oldest child. In 1105, we came up with a solution of how to handle that problem. At 11.05 and 5 seconds, I am sound asleep. <laughs> Man, I don't have to worry about it no more. The problem's been solved. I wake up the next morning, and I'm down at the breakfast table sitting beside my significant other. What's the first thing she brings up in the morning if you had a problem at night? The same problem. Yak, yak, yak. Back over it again. How do you like to handle that, guys? Let's exit stage left. I'm sorry, dear. It's 3.30 in the morning. I get out and open up the squadron for the guys. I'll see you around, honey. And you're going to go out through the door, whether you want to leave at that time or not. 
as far as breakfast is concerned. But you want to get away from that because you do not want to deal with that problem the second time. You've dealt with it once. That's all you need to deal with it. And hopefully when you return home from the office, that problem will be solved by her and she don't have to talk about it again. So we will exit stage left. If you lose control and show your feelings, sometimes you will react in violence and anger. You are number one in the United States of America as far as professional people, doctors, lawyers, crew members. You're number one in the United States of America as far as professional people in relation to wife abuse. Number two, by the way, is race car drivers. Shooting in a very elite group. Keep up the good work, guys. Okay. You're number four as far as child abuse is concerned. And so you're going to have to work a little harder. You all don't want to buy that, but it is very true in this business. The last act of a man who's trying to control, that is losing his rationality, what he does is he'll finally reach out in violence and try to control the situation that way. Okay? And that's one of the things that we do. Individual in this career field usually deploys one to two weeks before he goes TDY. Is that right? Is that what you guys do? Individual in this career field usually deploys one to two weeks before he goes TDY. See, Uncle Sam says to you, you're going to go to Insulik, Turkey for the next six months. And that's going to cause you problems because you don't want to go there and you don't want to be away from your family that long. Short TDY is fine, but we're talking something over a couple weeks in length and you're going to have to be away from home. That's a safe place that you go home to. Okay? That's a house where you can sit down, put your feet up on the coffee table, drink a beer and watch TV. By the way, that's all your wife says you ever do. I want to make sure you understand that. We say, well, doesn't he do it? No, he doesn't take any responsibility for the family. He just brings the money home. And now all of a sudden, Uncle Sam you got, says you've got to leave that area. And you've got to go somewhere else. And that creates problems inside of you, and you're going to start to react with that. And what you're going to do is you're going to do what we call the half step backward, the silent mode, the kind of withdrawal system. You're just going to kind of withdraw with inside yourself and become a little bit more silent. Who's the first one in your family that sees that? The old lady. Try you turkey, you're getting ready to leave next week. Look the way you're treating me, you stupid jackass. You say you can't talk to me this way, that way, bitch. <laughs> and for the last three days that you're home, you're arguing pretty great with your spouse. And when you leave, you're saying, serves the old lady right. Let her handle it herself. Piss on her. And she's saying, I'm glad that SOB is leaving. Now I'm going to have some peace and quiet. And when you leave, you get out on your TDY, you change the way you look at the world because all of a sudden you start to feel a little guilt over it. And you start to write home warm, mushy letters and say things that you will not say in person. Dear Jane, I love you so much. Golly, you're such a wonderful woman. I hardly wait to get home and get in your pants. Goo! <laughs> Gee, you're wonderful. Super wife, super woman. Love you. Ad nauseum love, Fred. And you will continue to write those letters until you're ready to come home. And all of a sudden you realize you cannot pull that crap off because you don't say it in person. And so the last week that you're TDY, you will change the way you write, and you will write a different letter. Dear Jane, the weather out here is fine. The guys and I are flying our butts off. I don't have a lot of time to write. I hope to see you soon. Affectionately, Fred. That's who's coming home, bitch. The same guy that left. Okay? Affectionate Fred, not loving Fred. And when you get home, you brag to your crewmates and your wingmates and all the rest of the people what you're going to do the first night home. You're lying through your teeth. You don't get it the first night you're home. Guess who's in control of your family when you get home? Is it you? Uh-uh. Who wants to be in control of your family? It's you. You bet you're sweet. Bippy, it's you. And so when you get home, what you've got to do is get back up on that pecking order. And as soon as you get home, you start picking. How come the tire pressure, the tires are down, hon? You know I like to keep that up. How come the car is dirty? How come the furniture's moved around the house? How come you got a haircut? How come we're not eating at 5.30 like I used to eat at? And so you will continue to piss and moan for about two or three days until you're back up on top of the order, and then you'll get some, because that's when you'll have some good feelings about each other. Speaking of getting it, we want to make sure you, we, we kind of explode a myth here. You do get it every 5.1 days. That is the national average for air crew members in the Air Force. Okay? <laughs> It's not what you guys say, every 2.3 or something like that. It's every 5.1, okay? By the way, the national average for everybody else is 4.7, so we're not as good as we think we are. Um, we just want to kind of point that out. You're a mission-oriented compartmentalizer. You put everything inside its own little compartments, and the reason being is, and it's what makes you so dang good at what you do. When you're in this compartment, 
then you can do your job 100%. I.e., when you get out to fly, you don't want any trash from the <coughs> office, from home life, from anything in your compartment of flying. You want to do your job 100%. And so what you've learned to do is to kick all the other trash out. Well, if it's so good for flying, why shouldn't it be good for everything else? It is. You use it. You have compartments for everything you do. Don't you? How about the 3S compartment in the morning? The shit, shower, and shave? You get up and you have a very set pattern about the way you run your life in the morning. First thing you do when you get up in the morning, some of you might go get a paper, some of you might get coffee. Most of you are going to do some kind of a biological function. By the way, you all have perfect control of your bowels. You can crap on command. It's now 7.33, crap, okay? And you can crap for 38 seconds if that's the way you crap every morning. It's a very, very personal thing that you have with your bowel system. And you do the first part, and then you go take a shower second. If you're going to shower in the morning and use a safety razor, you'll shower second. Only a fool and idiot would shave second and shower last. It takes time for the puffiness of the face to go down. You know that. You've, you're scientific. You've studied it. You guys got this all down to gnats behind, okay? And when you shave, you shave one way. You open up that cabinet, and that dang shaver better be exactly where you put it yesterday, because if it is a little off kilter in there, you're going to pull it out and say, leg here, come here, bitch. I want to talk to you a second about this, okay? And you're going to take that out, and you're going to shave the same way today that you shaved yesterday, and the same way you're going to shave 10 years from now. If you're right-handed, you're going to start on that side. If you're left-handed, you're going to start on that side. You're going to come down across there and underneath the chin and to the other side. Across the chin area, and that's the last area if you don't have a mustache. Every day, right through, uh, uh, and so many. If you did 33 strokes this morning, you'll do 33 tomorrow, 33 10 years from now. That's the way you say, all men do that. No, they don't. Depends on the professional groupings and the non professional We did some non professional guys. It's one they didn't cut their throats off in the morning. <laughs> Every morning it was different, okay? It was kind of an experience for them. <laughs> Every once in a while you look in the mirror and you say, wait a second, I don't want to be so rigid today. Instead of starting over here, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to start over here. Try something a little different. You get about the third stroke, you nick yourself, you say, piss on that. <laughs> Let's go back to the old way, right? Yeah. You come down from the 3S compartment, you sit at the breakfast table with your family, if they happen to be there at 6 or 7 in the morning, and you hold court. See, this is a bunch of idiots that you're married to and the kids that you're raising up. They don't know how to run their life. You guys are perfect. You got it all together, and you're going to tell them how to get their life together. Uh, dear Mary, make sure you get to the commissary today. We're running out of food. I need some cigarettes, and get the, the, the gas filled up in the car. And little Johnny, don't get in trouble at school today. Daddy's going to have to beat your butt when he gets home tonight like he did yesterday. And little Janie, make sure the dishes are done so I don't have to hassle with you when I come home. You see, we want no problems when we come home. So we want to make sure these idiots know how to run their life perfectly all day long. And we're going to tell them right at the very beginning. Sometimes we wonder why our family doesn't like us too much. I don't understand that myself. <laughs> we drive to work. That's a special compartment. We work at a desk. That's a special compartment. We fly our airplane, and that's our very special compartment. I don't know what it is. And I'll explain a little later on. But I don't know what it is exactly why we like it all the time. Because we get a lot of trash out. But that is the one compartment that you guys are in this business for. For all practical purposes. You wouldn't take a lot of this crap without being in this sort of a business and getting something out of it. Okay? And I will explain that to you a little bit later on. And that is the most sacred compartment you have for all practical purposes. In fact, every other compartment can break down and have problems in it. This is the one you'll hold sacred until the last thing. It's the last place that you fail at. <clears throat> then we have other compartments called the all other compartment or the garbage pail compartment. In here we put things like our own mortality. If you've ever scared yourself in an airplane, you will put it inside a little five gallon bag over your shoulder. You don't like to look at your own death in its face. You don't like to look at the fact that you might not live past next year or this month. If we asked you individually how long you're going to live, you're going to tell us, oh, 78, 85, 96. It's amazing how long you think you're going to live, okay? And the reason being is because we're afraid to look at that. It's very frightening to us. And if you've scared yourself in an airplane, you put it in this bag for a specific reason. If you're in the same situation again and you're in control of that situation, what you're going to do is pause before it gets real bad. And you're going to reach back in that bag and you're going to drag it out and say, I was here before. And the next thing I did, I moved a stick to the right, scared to piss out. I ain't going to do it this time. No sir, re Bob, straight and level, okay? Because we don't want to go into those frightening situations again. We put something else inside this bag. It's called 
Infidelity. Oh, gee, don't talk about that. That's kind of nasty. No, I want to talk about it. I don't want to say that all of you do it or half of you do it or 20% of you do it. I'm saying every once in a while somebody does. And I want to deal with the problem as it is, not as a morals lecture, but in the viewpoint of what really happens to us when we do these sorts of things. As I said before, what was good for me at 25 now starts to change as I look, get a little older. I start to look at it different. And at 35, maybe it's not as much fun or there's some problems associated with it. And at 40, 45, it's even a different situation. But once I've started a habit pattern, it's very difficult for me to break. And here's what happens and what we're trying to tell you. If you're messing around, we say stop. If you're not messing around, we say don't start. And if you're messing around and you can't stop, we say one other thing. Lie like a son bitch. That's terrible, isn't it? Isn't that gross? Let me tell you why we say that. Finally, after all these years and the guilt builds up, I'm finally going to have to do something about my problem. Who am I going to tell my problem to? Let's go through the list again. Wing commander, am I going to tell him I'm messing around? No. Squadron commander? Uh-uh. Flight surgeon? Uh-uh. Priest, minister, rabbi? It's only for queers and sissies. Squadron mates, they know. They know. The only person we think can get rid of our problems is our wife. And we will take the problem home to her and we will sit down and discuss it with her. Honey, I was out last week and I was on this TDY and this girl just happened to sit down in my lap and it'll never happen again. I swear to you, okay? I promise. <sighs> Boy, now I got the guild out. I'm having a catharsis, okay? Do not be surprised that if you do this, this is what you hear. It's all right, my sweet, I understand that. You see, a lot of people have those problems. I did it myself last week. <laughs> see, she knows that she can destroy your ego and she's going to try. And so she will come up with the same sort of thing to try to control you. And you'll say, wait a second, I've been doing it for 10 years. And she says, no problem, the football team last month, okay? She's going to beat that one thing that she knows is fragile on you, and that's your daggum ego. And she's going to destroy you, folks, and you're going to end up destroying her. That's why we say, number one, don't start. Number two, if you started, stop. And if you can't, go get some professional help and get the dang thing worked out. Because it will create problems in both of your lives down the road. We guarantee that. We flat guarantee it, okay? <clears throat> you have another compartment called the get home itis compartment. Inside this, we put things like we're good. Gee, we got over 50 hours flying time, man. We're really crap hot, you know. We can go out and fly and do anything now. And we get into the point where we start taking long TDYs and coming back from them that we will start to take airplanes that are not quite perfect. Nothing really drastically wrong with them, just some little minor problems, like maybe one of the radios is bad. We got a backup and another good primary. Shucks, let's press on. And we'll get by with it. We get into a habit pattern. Next time out, we might take a bad radar. VFR, let's press. Short distance, let's go. And pretty soon, we back ourselves into so many holes, we can't get out of them. The get home itis missions have a much higher mortality rate than any other training mission you ever fly, except for two. Does anybody know the two worst missions you can fly? Search and rescue and medevac. Those are the two that are missions to kill. If you ever get involved in them, you dang well better know it. It's like during those missions we say to ourselves, we've been training for the last 12 years to go out and save somebody's life or to do something special. Now, dang it, we're going to do it. Let's take the training, put it off the side, do our job. And you'll cut corners, run the checklist faster, fly the airplane lower, faster, take chances. And they are missions to kill. 25% higher mortality rate on those missions than any other that you will ever fly, including combat. Okay? Very aware of that in Vietnam. Came back from the north, we were flying thuds. Came back from the north, had one of the guys, the wingman in my group, shot down in the Magia Pass area. And of course, that was old Joe. And what did we do? We stayed right close by and strafe for old Joe, made sure the gooks didn't come in and get him, okay? We like to use that kind of stereotype for the other people. You know, they're not human beings. And we stayed by and we brought the F-4s in and the Sandys and the Jolly Greens and by the time we had old Joe out, we had nine other aircraft down in the same area, folks. And I can show you time and time again stateside where those things happen also. O2 that happened out in Nellis about six years ago. Another O2 went down, a Civil Air Patrol went down, a helicopter went down, same sort of scenario. So if you get involved in those missions, be aware of them. There are missions to kill you. And you better go into them, all your missions, as training missions. You got married and your spouse lives in a marriage. 
Is that the same thing, or is that, does that sound right to you? You got married and your spouse lives until marriage. You're married? Okay. Not to pick this gentleman right here. I'm going to pick on him right now. We sit him down and we say to him, hey, tell us a little bit about yourself. Two children? You have two children? You have one you work on the second one? Better hand, because that's the Air Force average, two, okay? Unless you have two daughters, then you have to keep working until you have the son, okay? But normally it's two, two kids. Um, we sit him down, we talk to him, we say, tell us a little bit about your wife and your kid. Oh, yes, he said, I was married uh, June uh, 23rd, 1978. Wonderful wife. She's uh, five foot six. She was born such and such. She's uh, so so old. Pretty gal, etc., etc., etc. Talks about the child when the child was born, how old he is or she is. Talks a little bit about how neat the child is. And then he stops. And we say, go ahead. And he said, well, that's it. <sighs> you know, you grow up. You're supposed to have a good job. He's got one. You're supposed to have a wife and a child or two. He's got them. Check. Got them done. Okay. We sit his wife down and we ask her the same question. She says, yeah, I was, uh, we were married on uh, June 23rd, 1978. And she goes through the same thing, talks about him, what a wonderful husband he is. She talks about the child, how, when the child was born, uh, how old the child is. She will stop at basically the same point he stops. And we'll say to her, go ahead. Guess what? She goes ahead, man. She keeps talking about how she's working in the marriage and trying to keep it together. We say, what about old James there? She says, uh-uh. No, yeah, he just goes to work and comes home. Sits down and goes, oh, I'm tired, honey. What's to eat tonight? Doesn't he help with the child? No. Doesn't he help with the responsive? No. Now, that's not necessarily the way it is in your family. I want to make sure you understand that. That's the way your wife perceives it sometimes because you don't give out as much at home as you do at work. You might be doing a heck of a lot at home, but they don't perceive that it's a lot compared to what they're doing, okay? So they perceive you as getting married and they perceive themselves as working 24 hours a day in a marriage. All right? You're predictable. You're systematic and methodic. You're checklist free. Checklists checklist are good for you. They get you through check rides, missions. They get you through your training programs on the base. They get you through your shots and all that. Oh, that's by checklist. Well, if it's so good for you there, why shouldn't it be good for you at home? It is. You use them. Don't you guys have checklists at home? Oh, I know, I'm not written down, but don't you have them for things? Like when you go on a vacation, don't you have a checklist for that of sorts? Oil has been checked, check, Raj, 32 pounds, check, got them all there, the car's been cleaned up, everything's checked, belts look good, mm-hmm. Everybody got their underwear, check, got that. Everybody got uh, four cans of beans, check, okay. See, we want no surprises when we get somewhere else. We want everything in control. Speaking of vacations, your vacations are for shit. They stink, they're miserable, they're rotten. Let me give you the Air Force scenario of a vacation. Okay, family, this year we're going, this is God speaking. We're going to Disney World. Wow, Dad, Disney World, yeah. We'll be departing Langley Air Force Base <laughs> at 6.53 Friday morning. Heading out to Emporia, heading south on I-95, stopping at exit 102 at 11.03 in the morning, eating there at Hardy's until 11.37 past the hour. Back on I-95, heading south, stopping in another exit at such and such a time, getting to the Orlando Turnpike at 6.29 past the hour. Heading on the Orlando Turnpike should take us an hour and 22 minutes. Going over to Orlando, we should get into Orlando at 9.07. Plus and minus 30 seconds. Now, don't trap old dad when we get into Orlando, okay? And God help it if it's 6.53 Friday morning when you're ready to leave, and you've been ready for 15 minutes pacing around the car saying, where are they, where are they, okay? Little Johnny's still in the crapper, okay? First thing you're going to do is jump on the old lady. How come you didn't have little Johnny ready for crying out loud? You know I'm ready to leave. We're behind schedule already. And when little Johnny comes out, let's beat the living piss out of him. What's wrong with this guy? My God, it's not perfect like Dad yet. Come on, kid, let's get it together. You ever notice when you put your kids in the car? Take a look, look, uh, 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 look at your arms, about that far away from you, okay? Because you want to get them, shut up, kid, okay? That's where you keep them? Sure. And through the rest of the trip, we're kind of pickering and bickering and moaning our people because they're not on our schedule. Folks, your children and your family will never be on your schedule. You play by a military drummer, and they will never play by that drummer, ever. And what you need to do is compromise and know them a little bit as they are. Their drummer is kind of a weirdo. It's kind of, okay. Ours is very, very set routine pattern. 
And what we've got to do is understand our children and our wives and their needs. I did not know my children the first 10 years of my life with them. I thought they were weird, screwed up, snotty little clowns. The last 10 years of my life, I took time to understand them. They're weird, screwed up, snotty little clowns, okay? But they're unique and they're kind of lovable in their own way. And what we did in our family is we compromised. I like to leave at 6.53 Friday morning. That's one of my bags, is a start that's on time early. And my family says, we'll do that with you. And I said, I'm going to control the money because it's the money that I'm making here. And I'm going to say there is $700 set aside for this vacation. And they said, those are the two things you get to control. We get to control the destination and where we go and how we get there. I said, fine. So I now pull out of the driveway. My kid says, turn left. <laughs> and I have no idea where we're going. But it has kind of been unique because now when I come off of vacations, I say, dang, I got some rest that time. Instead of the old way, when I came off the vacation, I used to say, God, I'm glad I get back to work so I can have some rest. Okay? That's the difference. You take time to smell the roses and know your family. Your kids will leave you faster than you know. Even though right now you say they're never going to leave. Okay? But they will leave you faster than you know, and you better get to know them as they are. All righty. By the way, those are the good things about you that I just covered. Okay, so let me cover the defects in your personality. Like I said, it comes across negative. It's not meant to be that way. These are the defects. You lack spontaneity. You're a sucker for complacency. The role of ritual in itself is a trap. Familiarization breeds contempt, and positive male feedback is what drives you. Watch my lips. You love men more than you love women. Huh? I'm no faggot. <laughs> I'm no faggot. That's hard for me to understand, right? You love men more than you love women. It's tough on the ego, isn't it? But it's very true. But I'm going to let you think about that a little bit until we get to that last part there. I'm going to let you all have that in your own mind. I'm going to cover the other things first. You lack spontaneity. You all have been in a business where it's stimulus response. This is an ISD program. Everything is done through instructional system development. We give you a stimulus. You give us a response. That's what it's all about, OK? You know, training and air crew members and all that crap is stimulus response. And we don't do a lot of spontaneous thinking. Y'all are extremely intelligent people. Don't get me wrong. You're one of the highest IQ groups there is in the United States. But you do not free think. Y'all buy that? If you don't buy it, let me ask you a question. How many times in the last year have you come up with a brand new idea that changed somebody's life? Or you came up with a brand new invention? Show of hands. I've briefed over 16,000, almost 20,000 people now. And I've had three Air Force crew members raise their hand. Three valid new ideas. And that is because we're not trained in spontaneity. You dang well better believe you're not trained in it. When's the last time Uncle Sam said to you, here, take an airplane, go wherever you want, come back whenever you want, you don't even have to fly plan. Bye. That's not the way we do our business. It's plan, 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 stimulus, react. And it's good for you because when you get an emergency situation, stimulus, react. And that's why you're so dang good at it. But it will also cause you a problem in that same area. If you ever come up with a brand new emergency that is not covered by the Dash 1, you have been trained to still react to it. And you will make a quick decision and try to react to it. And in around 90 to 95% of the cases, you will be wrong on that first response. That's what we're trying to tell you. Because you're not coming up with a lot of free thoughts. And what we're trying to say is any emergency you ever have, except for a couple little ones that you, a couple like on takeoff and landing, where you only got a fraction of a second to make a decision, almost every one you have in an aircraft, you have plenty of time to at least think about it a couple seconds. And what we're trying to say to you is come up with between four and six ideas with you, with your crewmates, with your wingmates, with a guy on the ground, whoever else. Give enough thought processes so that you have four to six alternatives. And if you do, what you will probably do is pick an alternative that was not your first alternative. And around 87 to 89% of the times, it'll be the right one for you. Okay? That first reaction you have under a brand new unique emergency will probably be wrong. Be aware of that. All right? You're a sucker for complacency because the person like you is a pro, and a pro has systems and methods, and systems and methods in the hands of a pro cannot fail. And what you've done is you bought or sold yourself a bill of goods and turned around and bought it lock, stock, and barrel. There are times you feel you're infallible. You do not make mistakes. 
And every time you feel that way, you dang well better not put your, your foot on that airplane ladder because that airplane's trying to kill you, okay? And you better understand it. Every time you fly, you make one error. So don't buy yourself into the fact that you're the best one there is in your business. You might be dang good, and most of you are, but you ain't the best, and even the best makes mistakes, okay? <clears throat> Familiarity breeds contempt. Airplanes only kill others. When you first started flying airplanes, you were afraid of them. I don't mean yellow. I mean you were in awe of them. You got in the cockpit, you looked at all the gauges there, and you kind of sat down, and you went, oh, <laughs> how can anybody do that? And you did it a couple times, and you said, it ain't that hard. Shucks, an idiot could do that. You looked at the syllabus and said you had these three hairy things to do in the next period of time. And you did them a couple times, and you said, this isn't that hard. This is pretty easy. And you changed your personality from going out to fly the airplane to going out and strapping the sucker on. Now you were in total control of it. You were the one that made all the decisions and did all the right things. And every time you feel that way, you better walk off that airplane. And every six months you're in a weapon system, you will become familiar with that weapon system. And every six months thereafter, you will have to go back and stand away from it and say, that sucker's trying to kill me. I'm starting to get complacent. I'm starting to get familiar. Okay? By the way, you have that in your marriage also. See, when you guys were first dating your wives, you were very aware of them. I'm sorry, honey, it's a little cold in here. Let me turn the temperature up. I'm sorry, my sweet, there's too much wind in your hair. Let me roll the wind up. Here's a lovely rose, my hon. We're going out to a great place to eat tonight. Tonight you'll go home, you'll sit down on the sofa, put your feet up on the coffee table, drink a beer, fart, belch, say, what's to eat tonight, bitch? <sighs> Familiarity breeds contempt. And if you don't do something about that every six months, you'll be married singles within five years. And it's something that you need to do is to take a look at that relationship every six months. Because you're not doing the things you were doing when you were dating that gal. Why? What's changed? Oh, she knows I love her. No, she doesn't. She needs to be told that. She needs to be shown that. All of us do. Okay? By the way, speaking of y'all having a bag over your shoulder, Y'all have a little five-gallon bag? Your wife has a hundred-gallon bag over her shoulder. Inside of her bag, she puts all of life's hurts, every one of them. And if you ever want to find out what pissed your wife off last week, piss her off today. She'll tell you. Remember what you did last week? No, man. You've already compartmentalized it out. She'll tell you what you did last year. You remember back in 1972 on October the 23rd at 9.23 in the afternoon? You know, man, I don't remember that. She does. And she will bring that trash out and throw it up to you at the most inopportune times, which is almost always, okay? Why does your wife have all that trash in her bag? Number one is the job that you're in, okay? When are you clowns going to TDY? When's your car break down? When's the refrigerator not work? When's the washing machine bust up and all the water go over the, the laundry room? When's the little Johnny break his arm? That's when you guys are gone. And the old lady's just taking that stuff and just shoving it right in the bag, man. And she's going to use it on you almost whenever she wants to. But the one thing that we think is unique and what you need to hear about this is every time you hear this trash, what she is really saying is you have become familiar with her. And what you need to do is go back and take a look at your own familiarity. It's a checklist item for you. Because if she does not believe that you're being familiar with her, she will not throw the trash at you. She will have a good feeling about who she is in life. Okay? So if, she, if you hear that, don't get pissed at her. Go back and say, what am I doing to cause this problem in this relationship? Ritual. Methodology supersedes the goal. I don't know what your rituals are or whether you have any, but if you get into them, get rid of your rituals in an airplane. They're killers. Let me give you a ritual that I have, and I can only equate what I do in rituals, and maybe you can take a look at it. Uh, many years ago, I flew a T-Bird. Some of you all know what the T-Bird looks like. T-Bird is the old single-engine uh, trainer. It had the gear handle on the left side by the ejection seat, not up on the front, okay? Traffic pattern, you get into it, you bring the power back until you get the gear warning horn on. Now you take the handle and move it from clear up to the top position of the ejection seat, clear down to the bottom, okay? The next thing you check was the warning horn out and the three indicators down and lock. The last item on the checklist was to reach back down to the bottom, grab a hold of that handle, and jiggle check that hummer. Any idiot could see that it was down. For God's sakes, it's through that far. And all I do is look at that 
reach down and tap the top of it. That was my ritual. Flew it that way many, many times. Finally got a traffic pattern one day, threw the gear down, got it down, locked, checked down, locked, tapped the top of it, ritual complete, checklist complete, press on. Downwind called tower, says turn base, base, or tower, uh, tab five zero, turn base with wheels, touch and go, request, touch and go. Right, Joe, you're clear, touch and go, check your wheels down, lock. I didn't have to look, I was good. Power coming back, descending, flaps coming down, airspeed really increasing. It was funny what God did that day, he gave me about a 40 knot headwind on base. Had to keep bringing the power back. The warning horn came on. You know how difficult it is and how stupid it is to land with the gear warning horn on in an aircraft? I mean, that's dumb. Punch it off. Sure. About halfway through base, tower started talking to some idiot in a traffic pattern with some kind of a problem, emergency. You know, and he was on guard, by the way. You know how difficult it is to listen to tower and all the other communications frequency when some idiot's on Navy common? Turn it off. You betcha. Turn final. On final, it was funny what God did that day. He gave me about a 40 knot headwind on base, and when I turned final, he gave me about a 60 knot or on final. Power back past idle, still high airspeed. I was a good pilot. I was going to stick it on the ground. No sweat. I needed that touch and go for currency. About 400 feet from touchdown, two flares shot across my aircraft. My first reaction, and I still remember it, was one of total anger. Some stupid jackass is clogging my runway. Now I can't get current in my touch and goes, and I only have enough fuel for one. Golly, slammed the throttle in, reached down to grab the gear handle, and I broke those two knuckles right there. And through the pain of that, I realized that the warning horn was for me, the airspeed was for me, the call on guard was for me, the flares were for me. And what I'm trying to tell you is this, if you do a ritual in a cockpit, once you have completed that ritual, I don't care if the checklist was done right or not, everybody can be standing on behind you and saying, you didn't do it, dummy, and you will not buy into it. You will not buy into it because you believe your ritual is complete. Get rid of them if you have them. They're death traps. I guarantee it. That's why we have gear up landings, etc., etc., etc. Watch your rituals. Speaking of ritual, you have one in the family. It's called a kiss goodbye in the morning. Bye, dear. I'm going to work now. When you come home at night, same thing. Hi, dear. The wonderful aviator is home again. How are you? Now, when's the last time you stuck your tongue in there, rode it around, see what you had for lunch, huh? Gave her a little thrill about life. Give her something to be charged about. No, man, it's like we got married and we said we will honor, love, honor, trust, obey our wife until death do us part and we will kiss her when we leave in the morning and kiss her when we come home at night. Check, got one of those done. And it's taken as a ritual and every once in a while we need to do something about it to make it more exciting for her. Okay? The need for male feedback. You people love men more than you love women. Is that hard? Is that kind of a difficult, difficult concept? Let me ask you another question. Who gives you good feelings about who you are? Let's be honest. Who gives you the feelings, good feelings about who you are? Who do you look up to? Who makes you feel relatively important about you? You'd like to say yourself, but where does it come from, folks? The guys in the squadron that are around you. Now, nobody in the squadron is going to walk up to you and say, hey, I really love you. You know, you're a neat guy. They don't say that. What do they say? They give the little kind of pats. Nice job today. I really appreciated that. That was a good, good flight. Let's go out and have a beer tonight. Let's go have a picnic this week and let's do something like that. And as long as you're getting that from the guys, you people to feel totally happy about who you are as an individual because you're very much aware of your peers and how they look at you in relation to the other people in that unit. And that's very important to you. And it's the one reason why you don't know anything's going wrong at home. Because as long as it's going good at the business, you feel good about yourself, and you think everything at home is just fantastic. And the other reason why this maleness is in here and you love men is because the airplane you fly is a male. It's not a female. We take them as males, okay? And there's something that you get out of flying that you get out of nothing else in life. It's the reason you're in this business. Does anybody here tell, can anybody here tell me why you like to fly? Why you really love to fly? Do you all understand it? I mean, some of you guys have been flying for a long period of time. What's it about? We've asked aviators the world over about it. Now everybody says, well, I kind of, gee, it's kind of fun. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's kind of enjoy. Gee, I don't know. 
But we found one guy many years ago who says, yeah, I love to fly. And we said, why? He says, that's simple. We said, really? So we got out the paper. We started writing down. This guy told us why you people like to fly. Let me tell you why. He said there was that day. He said it was November 8th, 1976. I was over in Okinawa. He said um, it was a hot, muggy early morning. Sun wasn't up yet. He said it was raining and miserable. And every time I tried to get my airplane airborne, it would break down and we'd have to go back. And we're saying, this is wonderful. But we kept writing anyhow. And he said, finally, five minutes before, I had to put my crew in crew rest. He said, we rolled the airplane out in the runway, called the power to it. He said, everything held together. We took off, climbed on out, got the 35,000 feet level off. He said, I put the aisle pad on, kind of trimmed the throttles up, leaned back in my seat, wiped the sweat off my brow. We're writing this all down. He said, about that time, I looked out over the front of the cockpit there. <clears throat> he said, when I looked out, he said, the sun kind of broke up over the edge of the water as the clouds broke away from the water, and the water was very calm, and the rays came down over the water. He said, it was absolutely gorgeous. He smiled a little bit. We said, go ahead. Tell us what makes you really like to fly. I like flying. He said, that's it. That's why I love flying. Does that make sense yet? Every once in a while, you're flying in that airplane doing the dog crap job that you have to do sometimes, and you look outside and you say, ain't this neat shit? <laughs> Back to work. Back to work. And as long as you get that once or twice in about a two-month period of time, you guys are totally happy. We can put all kind of crap on top of you, and you'll accept it because you're getting that one thing that makes a big thrill in your life, and that's a maleness thing for you. That's why you like men more than you like women. Okay, speaking of that, where does your spouse get her positive strokes from? Excuse me, some of you all did say you were married. Is that not right? I thought maybe one or two of you in here was married. Where does your spouse get her positive strokes from? The husband. The husband. Oh, 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 we hope that's the case. We really do. But even if you're the most perfect husband in the whole world, you can only give your wife about 50% of what she needs. I'm talking about perfect husband. She needs to get some within herself and from the people around her. But a lot of y'all think that your wives get a lot of positive strokes from the children, right? Don't they get a lot from the children? Come on, let's not let's see what everybody else is doing here. Some of you do. What we ask you to do, if you really in your own secret mind believe that, what we ask you to do is take a week's vacation this summer. Seven days, ten days, whatever. And we want you to spend 24 hours a day with your children. Okay? Oh, one little caveat to that. We want you to send your wife on the first vacation she's ever had alone and you spend it truly with your children 24 hours a day. And you answer their 30,000 why questions every day. You clean their snotty little noses and wipe their butts and feed them eight times and hassle them into bed. And we want you to come back after 10 days and tell us what a fantastic, wonderful job that is. It's one of the most degrading jobs in the whole wide world, folks. And it tears people down and doesn't build them up. When you and I look at our children in perspective over the last year, we say, hey, they're neat or they're not neat. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it's a very, very lousy job. And your wives don't get a lot of positive strokes out of that. How about from their jobs? Do you, your wives get a lot of positive strokes from their jobs? Hmm? Well, let's put it this way. You're a very mobile society. You move every 2.7 years. And every time you move, you're moving, quote, up the ladder of success, supposedly. And most of your wives, when they move, if they were teachers or nurses or whatever, they had moved up, and as they move, they go right back down to the bottom and have to start all over again. So they don't get a great amount out of that. How about from the neighbors and friends? They get a lot from the neighbors and friends. Guess what your wife says to the neighbors and friends? She's talking about you. Look what that turkey did last night. See, she's getting something now, but she ain't getting much in return. Well, if she's not getting it from there, then where she, should she get it? As you all said, she should be getting some of it from you. Let me give you the typical Air Force scenario about how to give positive strokes. Let's say I go home tonight, and I, I like to eat my dinner at 5.30, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Don't tell my wife that. Uh, I walk home and the dinner's there at 5.30 and there's wonderful meat. There's absolutely gorgeous peas sitting there and the mashed potatoes are burnt. What am I going to say? I mean, I'm paying this woman a hell of a lot of money for this, right? Burnt potatoes, bitch. <laughs> well, I'm going to let her know when she fails. I come home tomorrow night and I sit down at 5.30 and there's a lovely meat platter there and there's a lovely vegetable there and the potatoes are perfect. What do I say? 
Nothing for crying out loud. That's the one I'm paying her for, right? Or the positive negative. Well, at least you didn't burn them tonight, bitch. <laughs> Give her one more shot for last night, all right? Um, what, what we're trying to say is for every negative stroke you give your wife, it takes seven positives to bring her back up to normal. Seven for one, folks. That's a psychological fact. So if you're giving her a zing once in a while, you better be giving her a lot of positives. If your wife's over 30 years of age, she's probably thought of suicide once. She's thought of divorce twice. That's common in this business, okay? Just be aware of it. They have a very low self-esteem about who they are because they're still your wife and the children's mother, but they seem to have no identity of their own. And sometimes they need to work on that, okay? All right. <clears throat> so what's a failing aviator? We're in the last couple minutes of it. What's a failing aviator? It's a person who cannot compartmentalize. He all of a sudden has some problems where it's starting to get into his flying business and he's starting to take chances. If he's in the failing aviator compartmentalization thing, if he's into this failing aviator syndrome, he will crash an airplane if he's in control of it within six months. He might pick up a DUI or two, and he might cash a bad check within that six-month period of time. But those are not the day-to-day -day signs and symptoms. I'll give you those later. Why would he get into this? Well, if it happens on the job that he's starting to fail, we will identify it in the business, and we will pretty much take care of it today in positive measures. And we don't see a lot of the failing aviator from the job. We see it when it happens at home. I want to make sure you understand one thing. If I'm talking to some of you all and you've been divorced or separated or had some very, very hard times in your marriage, I'm not talking necessarily to you. I do not mean that. What I'm saying is when these problems at home get to the point where the wife finally says, the heck with you, what I'm going to do is tell everybody in the world exactly what I think of you, that you become a failing aviator. And she takes the mega, megaphone out in the front porch and she says, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. Let me tell you about the turkey I'm living with. Number one, he's a lousy sex partner. She will attack your sexuality first. Number two, she will attack your maleness as far as a husband and as a father is concerned. For the first time, you'll start to hurt 24 hours a day. And you will manifest certain signs. Number one, if you're a smoker, you'll smoke more. If you don't smoke, you might pick up the habit. And in some cases, we've seen people take vacation, go away from the military community, get into the civilian community, and play the cool game, smoke the little funny cigarettes. Believe it or not, we have it in this business, okay? Trying to say to society, hey, I'm cool, I'm all right, no problem. Number two, if you drink, you'll drink more. If you don't drink, you might pick up that habit. Why would we drink during a period of time like this? Twofold. Number one, it's an anesthetist. It gets rid of the pain. Number two, it gives us reasons for our action. I'm sorry, dear, I didn't mean to slap your eye last night. I was drunk. See, it's not my fault. It's the booze's fault. I'll put it off there, okay? Number three, he buys the failing aviator automobile. Big, splashy sports car. Again, I'm not stepping on anybody's toes that has one right now. Some of y'all wanted one all your life. That's fine. We're talking about the guy in the squadron that's been driving around in a 73 Chevette three-speed on a column all his life. And all of a sudden, he goes out and buys himself a $44,000 yellow Porsche and drives the piss out of it. He's trying to tell somebody something. Number four, he picks up macho pastimes, scuba diving, skydiving, motorcycle racing. Again, if that's your, the way you like to live your life, that's part of you. But if you've been a milk toast in the squadron for 18 years, and all of a sudden, after 18 years, you go out of the back end of an airplane and go, Geronimo, okay? Now, we want to take a look at that because you're trying to tell something to somebody. Since the problem started in the bedroom, as far as the wife said in her uh, summation to us about how lousy we were, therefore the answer can be found in the bedroom, not your own, someone else's. And for the first time in your life, you'll go ugly early. You'll pick someone well below your status and just pray her always, look at boy, I can still do it, no problem whatsoever, all right? And the bottom line is you'll start to fly dangerously. You'll start to take danger, uh, dangerous uh, chances in an aircraft to prove to your squadron mates and the other people that you still have it. And of course, you're trying to commit suicide. That's the basic understanding. And we need to tell you that because you have to be taken out of the cockpit. Okay? So why do we brief you on this? How many of y'all are failing aviators? Show of hands. Dang it, I wasted my time again. I thought maybe we'd have 10, 12 failing aviators in here. Now, we don't brief it because we think you're failing aviators. We brief it for two reasons. Number one, for you to take a look at your life and how you run it and how you act in it. And number two, we came up with one startling statistic about a failing aviator. 
Guess who is the only person that can tell this clown that he's failing and get by with it? Let me go through the list again. Wing commander, squadron commander, flight surgeon, psychiatrist, priest, rabbi, minister, wife. No, this is a guy. This is a gal he's trying to fight. Guess who's the only person that can tell this clown he's failing and get by with it? It ain't him, because he's never going to buy into that. It's his buddies that he loves. It's the buddies that he cares about. His peers. And the reason why we brief you this is because if it happens in your squadron, and it's up to you, that's the only place the responsibility is going to work. You're the only person who can surround yourself around this guy and talk to him, and he will see that he's got a problem and get it taken care of. And most of them, when we've identified them, identified them have gone out and gotten professional help. And we're back on flying status in a very, very short period of time. Okay? That's why we brief you. We hope you never leave the service and say, dang it, I wish I'd have said something about old Joe. He was manifesting this. I wish I'd have said it before he killed himself. I hope you don't have that killed. That's all I've got unless you have any questions. Okay, let's take a five-minute break. We'll get you a pre-flight, get you in the chamber, call it quits for the day.